Greetings, everyone. Um, welcome to uh, Claire's defense. Uh, I'd like to thank you for taking time out of your day to be here. Um, so the order that we'll go through today is I will give a quick introduction to Claire um, and, and a um, very brief introduction on the research. Claire will present, uh, then we'll open it up for questions. Uh, for everyone. After that, we'll ask those who are not faculty to step out of the hypothetical room that we are in, um, and then we can uh, kind of ask Claire some questions in more technical detail um, as needed. So without any further, uh, without waiting, I guess. Um, so Claire Denerk is going to, Denek is going to present uh, her thesis today. Um, so actually, Claire worked with the arts group as an undergrad, um, was the very first one. So uh, Claire got a Magellan Fellowship as an undergrad um, and then helped me on a proposal. And she is two for two in proposal writing. So um, that's much better than me, uh, 100%. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, took mechanical vibrations with me my first semester and got a 96%. I taught the class and I could not have gotten 96%. The questions you got wrong, I took out of the homework the next year. Um, so they were bad questions, probably nothing to do with you. Uh, she did an accelerated master's program here at the University of South Carolina, which is something that I need to be more proactive in informing people about that. Um, and because of that, she has done this very accelerated. Um, but you'll see today that the uh, research portion of this is absolutely um, very intellectually uh, credible, I guess, or, or gifted. And, you know, I'm very excited for what we have today. Um, she recently took a job at IBM. So despite my begging and pleading, she won't be staying for a PhD, but that's fine. Um, probably made the smarter life choice in some ways. So uh, without, uh, I'll let her read the title because um, maybe that's part of her thing, but without any Further ado, uh, you, you're good to go, Claire. Okay. Thank you. Can you guys all see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. Like Dr. Downey said, my name is Claire Dernick, and my thesis is on local eigenvalue modification procedure for real-time model updating of structures experiencing high-rate dynamic events. So just to start out, a little bit of outline of what I'm going to be going through. I'll start out by giving an introduction and background as to what exactly high-rate dynamic events are and what our goal is with real-time model updating. Then I'll discuss some past work and as well as the purpose and methodology of the work here. Then I'll discuss some of the results and some further applications for the procedure, followed by some conclusions and summaries. So to start out, high rate dynamic events are defined as high rate and high amplitude events. So by high rate, it means anything that happens under a 100 millisecond time scale. By am high amplitude, any event with an acceleration over 100 Gs. So these are events such as crashes, impacts, uh, blasts, things like that. And these events are characterized by large uncertainties and external loads, high levels of non-stationaries and heavy disturbances, as well as unmodeled dynamics experienced by the system. So some structures that experience high rate dynamics in the case of a vehicle collision, um, both the vehicle itself as well as the airbag deployment system will be experiencing high rate dynamic events. In the case of blast mitigations, shocks and struts responding to blasts under a seat will also experience the high rate dynamics, um, as well as ballistic packages and hypersonic vehicles. So the main example that we are using for this research is the design of fuses for hard targets. So some challenges that come with designing fuses for hard targets is that you have a delicate payload exposed to a harsh environment. So here the delicate payload is the ballistic package and the harsh environment is the concrete wall. And some of the challenges that come with designing these things are that there are too many failure modes for a fly fix fly approach and full scale testing is just too expensive. And even if you were to full scale test these objects, um, you can't uncover all of the failure modes. 
The, the nice thing about this situation is that there's only three possible outcomes, which is initiation when intended, initiation before or after it's intended, and failure to initiate. So even though there's a lot of design challenges and failure modes, there's only three possible outcomes that those failure modes can result in. So the overall goal of this work is to develop a real-time decision-making algorithm for structures experiencing high rate dynamics. And in order to do so, we need two key technologies. The first is a low latency model updating. So that's the ability to update your model within two milliseconds. And the second is a near time prognostic of the system state. So that's being able to determine how your model is going to react within the next two milliseconds, three milliseconds, however far out you want to be able to predict how your model will react. And this, the main majority of the rest of this presentation will focus on the low latency model updating. So some of the challenges and constraints that come with real-time model updating is the limited computational power. This includes memory, processors, and available energy. Additionally, as mentioned before, there's so many fault cases that you can't pre-calculate them all. Additionally, the input forces and locations will never be known. And any rare or extreme events that happen must be accounted for by your model. So a little bit of background. The work here just that is discussed here all focuses on the drop bear test bed, which stands for dynamic reproduction of projectiles in ballistic environments for advanced research. So this test bed features two programmable changes that simulate high rate dynamic events. The first is a detachable mass and the second is a moving roller. Um, the moving roller is used in the rest of this presentation and the profile that is used for the work is shown on the top left graph. Bottom right shows a video of the drop bear test working in an experimental setup. As you can see, the roller moves back and forth along the beam and the location is tracked in real time using uh, the measured location, which is represented by the orange line on the top. The accelerometer on the far end of the beam picks up the accelerometer data from the beam and it is windowed in the second graph on the left. This data is then transformed into the frequency domain as you can see on the bottom left hand side. The work discussed here treats the drop bear as an Euler Bernoulli beam. So the Euler Bernoulli beam element is characterized by four degrees of freedom, two in the rotational and two in the bending. And when modeling the drop bear test bed, the left end is fixed as a cantilever beam, so both the rotational and bending degrees of freedom are constrained. And when the addition of a roller is located along the beam, the bending is also um, constrained at that location. And the work here uses modal analysis and a generalized eigenvalue solution to solve system states. So starting with the equation of motion, mx double dot plus cx dot plus kx equals zero, we can ignore the damping coefficient because it's negligible compared to the mass and stiffness um, matrices. Um, so we can solve this simplified equation of motion using a generalized eigenvalues approach as shown on the right hand side. This gives us the eigenvalues which correspond to the natural frequencies of the beam and the eigenvectors which correspond to the um, mode shapes of the beam. So some past work that's been done on the subject. The first is real-time model updating through error minimization. So this work was done in real time. Um, the experimental portion is what was shown in the video earlier of the drop, of the drop bear test bed. Um, the analytical portion created three finite element analysis models, each with 40 nodes, and solved those frequencies and then compared those frequencies to the measured frequency using error minimization. The, this work resulted in an update time of 4.04 milliseconds and an accuracy of 10.05 millimeters. The second work I want to discuss is accelerating model updating via adaptive meshing. This used the simulated data from the first project and improved upon the FEA models. So instead of using 40 nodes, this model used 11 nodes and the meshing was adaptive. So that means that the two end nodes on either end of the cantilever were fixed in their location. There was one node that was fixed to the roller, which was free to move along the beam, and the remaining nodes were distributed evenly along the beam. 
Again, the modal analysis was done using the generalized eigenvalue solution and the comparison criteria between the estimated frequency and the measured frequency was error minimization as well as a bounded regression technique. This resulted in a simulated update time of two milliseconds with an accuracy range of 6.9 to 24.41 millimeters. So the past two works that I've discussed have both have both solved state estimations using a generalized eigenvalue solution. The one issue with the generalized eigenvalue solution is that as you add complexity to your model, so mainly the number of nodes, the time to solve that generalized eigenvalue increases exponentially, as you can see on the top right graph. Additionally, the amount of time that was taken to solve the generalized eigenvalue solution for both of these work uh, far outweighed any of the other steps in the process. Um, as the bottom right hand figure shows, the red portion represents the time it took to build and solve the FEA models using the generalized eigenvalue, which takes up a majority of that time. So the state equations can be solved within the time requirements, either by simplifying the models as done previously or by simplifying the equations. The intellectual merit to this work is that the state equations are reduced in complexity and there is an improved search space for sampling roller locations. This is done using a similar procedure as the past two works. Again, the experimental portion is simulated, um, but the analytical portion has a few modifications made to it. The first is the modal state estimation. Whereas the past two works discussed used the generalized eigenvalue solution, this work uses LEMP. LEMP stands for the Local Eigenvalue Modification Procedure. It was originally developed by Wiesenberger in 1968 as a means to simplify state equations to meet the limited processing power of computers at the time. This is important to us because a study conducted at USC determined that in order <clears throat> For an FEA model to meet a one millisecond update time, the number of nodes was limited to 23. And additionally, 90% of the time that was spent solving the algorithm was spent solving the generalized eigenvalue solution. So some conclusions from that work are that the eigenvalue solutions are computationally expensive and there's a need for reducing the state equation complexity. So LEMP is used to model one change made in the system. So in the case of this work, it's the addition of a roller along the beam, and it simplifies the equations by representing an n degree of freedom system into n single degrees of freedom systems. So as you can see on the bottom right hand, the cantilever beam contains n plus one nodes, and based on the Euler-Bernoulli beam theory, each element has four degrees of freedom, so our final system will have two times the number of modes used to describe our system. That's how many degrees of freedom our system will have. So the LEMP redefines the system as having n single degrees of freedom system represented by the initial state on the top right, where each system has its own mass, frequency response, and stiffness value. And it models the change between the states, so the addition of a roller by coupling those masses together or by connecting those masses to ground. And this is important because it simplifies the nth order generalized eigenvalue to a collection of n second order equations that are bounded by the initial frequencies. This is a general flowchart of the LEMP procedure. The first step is computing a generalized eigenvalue solution for the initial state. Um, this is an important step because Although it's a generalized eigenvalue solution, it's only computed once. So those eigenvalues and those eigenvectors are saved and can be used for the rest of the uh, computations uh, further down the line. The next step is to simplify the model using modal representation for the initial state. This results in an initial state equation in terms of the pre-solved eigenvalues. The next step is to determine the system modifications. Here, delta K12 represents the change between states in physical space, where the diagonal values represent elemental mass to ground connections, and off diagonals represent the mass 
elements being coupled together. In this work, we're using a moving roller, so only the diagonal values will be affected. And furthermore, only the only non-zero terms will be associated with the degree of freedom at which the roller is located. The next step is to simplify the altered state model using modal representation and to um, write it in terms of the initial state as well as the changes made between the two states. This results in a state equation in terms of the pre-solved eigenvalues as well as the delta k 1, 2 matrix previously discussed. The next step is to simplify the model to only include the degrees of freedom that participate in the modification procedure. So here the only non-zero values of the delta k1 matrix, sorry, delta k1-2 matrix in modal space come from the rows of u1, which are the eigenvectors of the initial system that are associated with the degree of freedom change. This gives us a delta k1-2 matrix in modal space in terms of those degrees of freedom. That can be plugged back into the general eigen generalized eigenvalue solution. And instead of solving that as a generalized eigenvalue problem, you can manipulate the equation of motion to yield the LEMP equation on the bottom, which represents that collection of second degree equations to get the natural frequency of the altered state. The second modification that was made to the analytical portion is the surrogate model creation. So in order to use LEMP, you need to determine how many modes and how many nodes are considered in your model. The number of modes is mainly limited by the participation factors. The participation factors are can be found using the equation of motion for the altered state in terms of itself and solving for the eigenvectors. Um, the, U12 represents those eigenvectors, and they denote the weight that each initial mode plays in an altered mode. So as an example, you can create the modes of a cantilever beam using only the measured modes of a free-free beam. Here, the change between the two states is represented by the addition of stiffness in the rotational and bending directions at the leftmost end of the beam. If you solve the generalized eigenvalue solution, the eigenvectors you get are the participation factors as shown. And if you want to create the first mode of the cantilever beam, you can use the first five modes of the free free beam, as well as the participation factors circled in red to get the first mode of the cantilever beam. In the case of this work, the initial state was considered the cantilever beam and the altered state was the beam with the additional support of a roller along, along the free end. The participation factors were found with the support located at each node, and the contributing modes were weighted and tallied at the end. So as an example, this color chart shows the modal participation factors when the support is located at the second node. So if you take a look at the altered mode five in the red box, you can see that it's composed of contributions from the initial mode four with a modal participation factor of 0.2383, initial mode five with a factor of 0.7717, and initial mode six with a factor of 0.5489. Again, this was done with the support located at each of the roller positions along the beam. And the contribution factors were then tallied and weighted. Um, so the mode was considered a contrib contributing mode if the contribution percentage was greater than 5%. This left modes one through nine and modes 12. In addition to being limited by the participation factors, the number of modes was also limited by the experimental setup. So having a single accelerometer and only in one axis limited the modes to bending in the y direction, which left modes one through five, as well as modes eight and nine. And furthermore, the maximum frequency range of the accelerometer used was 0.02 to 1700 Hertz, which further limited the modes 
from mode one to mode four, which were selected as the final modes for our model. The second portion of the model creation process was determining how many nodes to use. This was done by comparing a LEMP solution using 100 elements, which was considered the true solution, to reduce models of 50, 25, and 20 elements. The first four frequency responses were then plotted against each other, and the cutoff error between the two was set to be 15 millimeters, which corresponded to an error of less than 5%. So for the 50 element reduced model, the frequency response was plotted as the roller moved positions along the beam. The same was done for the second frequency response, the third and the fourth. Here you can see that the error remained well below the 15 millimeter max allowable error, so the model was further reduced to 25 elements, where again the first, second, third, and fourth frequency response was plotted as the roller moved along the beam. Again, the error remained below the 15 millimeter cutoff, so we reduced the model to 20 millimeters, sorry, 20 elements. Here, the first, second, third, and fourth frequency response all yielded errors greater than the 15 millimeter cutoff, so the 25 element model was selected. This gave us a model with 25 elements and 26 nodes, as well as the first four modes um, chosen from the first portion of the model creation. The altered state is then represented by the addition of a roller in physical space or the addition of a spring in the LEMP process and is represented by coupling those masses together or by connecting them to the ground. The third portion of the analytical procedure that was modified was the roller selection, um, roller location selection. This was done using a Bayesian search space. So the previous state estimate was used to create a probability density function about the previous roller location. A randomly selected point was chosen from above the mean, and using a likelihood function and Bayes analysis, the remaining lo roller locations were determined. This was done using a Bayes equation, which represents the probability that the roller is moving right, as well as the two likelihood functions, which represent the likelihood that the selected roller location belongs to either the previous distribution represented by B or the distribution prior to that, which is represented by A. The idea is that there was three different possible cases. The first case is that the roller was and continues to move right. In this case, the, um, the chosen location above the previous mean is much Sorry, the previous the location selected above the previous mean is much greater than that of the prior mean. So that results in a likelihood that the chosen location belongs to the past um, density function, resulting in a probability that the roller is moving right to be greater than 0.5. The second case is that the roller was and continues to move left, in which case it comes to the opposite conclusion as case one, and that the roller location, the probability that the roller is moving right is less than 0.5. Last case is that the roller is switching locations. So some of the conclusions from the Bayesian search space is that if the probability that the roller is moving right is greater than 0.5, it is assumed that the roller is moving right, and the remaining locations are selected from above the previous mean value. If the probability that the roller is moving right is less than 0.5, it is assumed that the roller is moving left and the remaining locations are selected from below the previous mean value. If the probability that the roller is moving right is equal to 0.5, the remaining locations are selected at random. And finally, if the roller is switching directions, the Bayesian approach will come to the incorrect conclusion either based on case one or case two, but it will readjust when two consecutive directions are identical. So some of the results from this, um, the results are separated into two parts, a comparison criteria, which compares the experimental and analytical 
frequencies together and determines a state estimation. And then a model assessment, which compares the estimated roller location with the measured roller location to assess each model. The comparison criteria used here is similar to the past work in that it used the error minimization technique as well as bounded regression. The model assessment was used the absolute mean error in roller location as well as the time response assurance criterion um, or the track value. The track value ranges from zero to one with zero representing no correlation and one representing perfect correlation. The important thing about track is that not only does it assess the error in the estimated value, but also the error in the time delay that it takes to get that estimated value. So some of the results from error minimization, as you can see for the generalized eigenvalue solution, the lump solution and the base solution. Um, for the lump and the lump with Bayes solution, or Bayesian search space, the absolute mean error was reduced, and all three models offer very high track values. As you can see with the lump solution with the Bayesian search space, there's a lot less fluctuation around the error for the roller estimates. These are the results using bounded regression as the comparison technique. Again, you can see that the application of LEMP and LEMP with a Bayesian search space reduce the absolute mean error. And again, all three approaches offer a fairly high track value. If you take a look at the LEMP solution with the Bayesian search space, you can see that the fluctuation increased as compared to the error minimization technique. That's because there's a conflicting nature of approaches between the Bayesian search space and the bounded regression when the roller is, uh, when the roller is stationary. This technique was also extended to unsupported structures. So if structures were subject to flood or seismic activity, if their foundation was to erode, um, that would could be considered an unsupported structure. Additionally, printed circuit boards are potted or sealed with epoxy in order to protect the components and increase its usability. Um, however, if there is any contaminants in the epoxy or there are soft spots that also results in an unsupported structure. Um, so this procedure was shown that not only could it track the addition of a boundary location, it could also track the removal of a boundary location. So some conclusions from this work is that LEMP alone reduces the complexity of state calculations and improves with bounded regression comparison criteria. For the LEMP with the Bayesian search space, it reduces the search space for roller locations and provides a better estimate for unchanging systems. Um, this procedure improves with the application of error minimization for the comparison criteria. Finally, the LEMP procedure can also be used to model unsupported structures. So in summary, this work presents an algorithm for real-time model updating for structures experiencing high rate dynamic events, and it is verified using simulated data. The novelty of this work is that it implements LEMP not to meet limited pro processing requirements for old computers, but to minimize computation time of current computers. And also, the Bayes Bayesian search place was applied to detect system changes in real time. Um, some future work that could be done in this realm is implementing a time response and verifying the procedure using real time data. These are my sources and thank you all for coming. Are there any questions? Thank you, Claire. Yeah, uh, so I guess we can move on to questions. Um, feel free to speak up or there is a hand on the uh, top side of your uh, screen. If you'd like to ask a question, you can raise your hand. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, I just want to say thank you. It was a very nice presentation. And I saw, I'm sorry, I missed the first few slides, <laughs> but I, I got it, you know, when you presented the, the remaining part in the conclusions. I don't have question, maybe, you know, clarification. So this, the altered state you said, um, in one point I saw that 
there is a, a participation of modes, and their modes has some factors. You show that, for example, in one case you have mode four, five, and six, and each has a factor. So what are these factors? So these factors are called the modal, partic modal participation factors. Um, so I think it's easiest if I can show you on yeah. the simple example. Um, so the idea here is that if you're unable to measure the modes of a cantilever beam, you can create them from measured modes of only using the free free beam. So if you create, if you solve the eigenvalue solution to get this modal participation matrix, let's say you want the first mode of the cantilever beam, you can look at this first column of the participation factor matrix to get those participation values. And if you multiply those participation values by the initial modes of the free free beam, you can solve for the mode of the cantilever beam without ever having to measure it. So the colored graphs here represent a more complex, a larger matrix of me doing that for our experimental procedure. OK, uh, well, the participation factor. So they 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 might seem to be one, right? So it's not a distribution or when when I think about participation factors, I was thinking something else, you know, how much one mode is participating versus the other. But to get there, it's clear for me now. Yeah, <laughs> it's thinking, more like a weighted value as opposed to summing to one. OK. So Austin, I should ask a question later on now. You can um, either oh. or, as you wish. <laughs> I guess we'll typically ask later, right? So Yeah, we can ask later. OK. So I mean, particularly, are, do any of the other uh, students or, or visitors have a question? Um, clarification, now's a great time to ask the expert. I have a question. Um, I have a question. I'll, I'll ask it now just because uh, it's kind of intriguing. Um, despite me being involved in this project, I, I yet have another question, Claire. On <laughs> slide 47, um, you talked about picking your likelihood functions and then if your beam is moving to the, if your roller is moving to the right, uh, it is only picking locations to the right. And if your roller is moving to the left, it's only picking locations to the left. Um, so, or you said the remaining locations come from the right. Does that mean that all of the locations in those examples come from the right or from the left, depending on what your, your Bayesian inference is telling you? Yes, yeah, so the first selection is the roller location that it measured last. And then the remaining are, are all to one side, either above the mean or below the mean, based on the Bayesian approach. Um, so that's why if the roller, if the past two roller locations say that the roller has been moving right, and then all of a sudden the roller will switch locations, the Bayesian search space will come to the wrong conclusion based on the past two data points. Um, but once you have two consecutive locations, it will, like, it will correct itself. OK. So once it's going right and it knows it's wrong, it, it reverses and goes left. Yes. Perfect. That makes sense to me, at least. Thank you. Um, any other any other questions then from the audience? If not, I would ask you to step out of our proverbial room, um, our imaginary room here on, on the Internet. Um, and thank you for your time. Thank you for a nice presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Addis. You can stay if you'd like or if you need to go. I understand. It's not an issue. Um, I don't know if. OK, we actually had a couple of faculty members from other universities, but I think they left too. So 
that's fine. <laughs> Uh, Pooja, you want to leave? And Joe, I don't know who Joe is. Hi, Joe. He's my stepdad. Oh. <laughs> um, Joe, you have to leave. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, perfect. Okay, so. Uh, Should we stop the recording? Yes, we should. Thank you. Um.